Okay, welcome to a very special BSD Now this week. We're going to be talking about some new exciting changes that are upcoming to the show and uh, some personnel stuff. So you're going to want to stick around. It's going to be really exciting and we don't want you going anywhere. This is still your place to be SD. Okay, folks, well, we're ready to start this episode today, and as we hinted at in the cold open, we got something special to announce. So, some of you may have heard already, we haven't been super secret about it. I know some people at the conference have yeah. known and stuff, but uh, I'm actually, this is going to be my last appearance on BSD Now as a co host. I'll try and come back for interviews and stuff. Yes. But uh, after almost four years, I think, at this point 180 some odd episodes. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna... Rather, 180 some odd weeks in a row with a missing one. Yes, yes, That's yes. It's, it's really impressive that we managed to do that. That. But uh, as of this episode, I'm going to be stepping down, and uh, Benedict here, who's been a guest on this show before, yeah. mm -hmm. is going to be stepping in as your new co-host for BSC Now, and uh, I, for one, am very excited to yes. have you join the show. I think it's good to get a little new blood and excitement. Yeah, I'm even stuff. more excited. It's, it's yeah. going to be really, it's going to be a good thing, and I know you guys out in the audience are going to love it, too. Yeah. But I uh, just wanted to give you a couple of the reasons why I'm stepping down. Of course, it's been four years, and my career and day job has gotten busier and yeah. busier and busier and this this is a lot of uh, this is a big time commitment you know yeah. you guys got to give these guys a little appreciation when you see them because I don't think you realize how much work goes into making this show it's all day Wednesday I mean yeah. and then yeah. times a little bit on Tuesday too yeah stuff like so so for people Wednesday. who watch the live thing they see what kind of effort well, you yeah. and how many yeah. retakes you do and well we we don't do retakes. <laughs> we usually are pretty good. Like unless you know, we usually don't do a retake unless something really technically goes wrong. Yeah, but yeah. that's usually because we don't have the time to yeah. do it over again. Yeah, but I mean, it's a it's a one day a week commitment mm -hmm. for yeah. you know as long as you're doing the show, right? Yeah. yeah. Unless you guys get all cheap and start doing like vacations and reruns. Uh, no, 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 hopefully no, no, not. Yeah, we go all day. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's it's been a pleasure to do it. I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and of course, I'll still be no stranger at the BSD um, conferences, and I'll try and come on the show periodically to give you guys updates on FreeNAS, uh, TrueOS, you know, all the various IX systems, or IX systems based uh, products, things yeah. that we're working on. You get on. your regular interview spots. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'll be happy to come back and do that. You guys know you can get a hold of me anytime. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to take this time to introduce uh, your new co-host, Benedict, and wish you guys all the luck in the future going forward and Thank a successful you. show. And uh, I, for one, will always be a big supporter of it just yeah. because it, it was a really important part of my life, too. Yeah, yeah. Such a long I can time. imagine that. So, uh, and Alan, I don't know how you did it with two shows. I mean, I'm glad you yeah. got tech snap. <laughs> yes, I, I handed that one off to Dan uh, because it was important to keep this one going. Uh, sure. And, you know, the original plan was I was already doing tech snap on Thursdays. So I was like, maybe we can do BSD now on Mondays. Sure. And then I'll have a couple days in between. But then Wednesday was the only day that worked for you. And I'm yeah. like, well, that can yeah. kind of work. Even more so now. It's like Monday's all-day yeah. meetings, Tuesday's all-day meetings, and sometimes on Thursday. So it's getting tough. I, yeah. I had to make a choice between doing more development or doing more BSD now. And I really yeah. like, I don't get enough time to do development, yeah. right? There's a lot of true OS stuff I want to do and, mm -hmm. and things I do on FreeNAS yeah. and elsewhere. So I'd like to have my name out there attached to some code occasionally. Too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I used to know how to program. It would be nice to do that. Again. Yeah. So. You provide the content for future That's interviews. That's right. And I'll be more than happy to come on and give you guys new content, right? <laughs> you guys will hopefully be talking about stuff we've written about mm -hmm. uh, or written in you know future months to come. So, yes, uh, so that will be exciting. It's going to be exciting stuff. And, of course, we're going to wish you guys all the best. And uh, Thank you. I guess that's about it. You guys are going to have your regularly scheduled show now. So Benedict's going to be sitting here instead of me. And uh, Well, you don't get off quite that easily. Oh, I don't? We still have to do an exit interview, right? Oh, yeah. gosh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm just going to give, tell you guys, you know, don't be too mean on Bendix. It's yes. first day. Give him a chance. <laughs> we'll you make this work. Yeah. yeah, you people watching live, you know, <laughs> be nice to him. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be good, though. I think you guys are in for a treat. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I wish BSD now many more successful years, and someday you'll yes. be hitting that 500 episode mark. 
And when that happens, you gotta. I want to come back as a guest. Yeah, yeah, we make a special, a very special. Right, I think that's well, three hundred. That's still okay. Three hundred. Alan's away. already that's thinking. Like, I'm not gonna make it to five hundred. <laughs> okay, three hundredth episode. I'll come back. That, that's yes. uh, yeah. Yes. That'll that'll. Be you awesome. heard it. Yeah. You heard you it here. Reserve that slot. <laughs> we'll reserve that way in advance. So yeah. looking forward to it. Of course, in my luck, it'll be like the week between Christmas and New Year's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that has happened. It has happened. It has happened. So you know, once for old times' sake, I'm down with that. Yeah. This week's sponsor is DigitalOcean. Uh, they provide virtual machines where you can run FreeBSD with UFS or ZFS, and it only takes 55 seconds after you click the button in their web interface, yeah. you and can you have stand a there with server. a stopwatch and yes. just watch and see. After 45 yeah. minutes, it's or 45 uh, seconds. Seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, minutes so, is not very impressive. Seconds exactly. it is. <laughs> exactly. You know, you want FreeBSD? Click, 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 and you can pick what data center you want it in, whether that's San Francisco, Toronto, New York, London, uh, Amsterdam, uh, there's one ones. in Germany, yeah. uh, one in Bombay in India, and one in Singapore. So From you just pick what you want, you get native IPv6, you get IPv4, uh, they have private networking you can choose so that if you have multiple droplets, you can uh, data transfer between them is free. Mm -hmm. it makes it really nice to have a front end for your website or something and a back end with your database. Uh, or whatever, yeah. uh, and they support FreeBSD uh, and with UFS or ZFS. Yeah, uh, and you get a coupon code with yes. our episode so that you can uh, test it out for a couple of minutes or whatever you want to test, and then um, you just stop the instance when you're done, and mm -hmm. you will only get built for that specific amount of time that we're yeah. using that so, machine. So uh, when you sign up, go into your account in their coupon code and enter the coupon code FreeBSD now uh, and you'll it'll add ten dollars to your account uh, so that can run the five dollar a month uh, droplets for two months without uh, any cost for you yeah without you having to spend any more money uh, and you can stretch it even further if you use the instances hourly uh, because then you only pay for the time you actually have the instance uh, existing if you just delete it when you're done you only paid uh, for the fraction so you're actually always paying hourly, uh, and they just limit the price to the monthly price. Hmm. Uh, so if you spin up a droplet this week, uh, you know, halfway through the month of March, at the end of March, you don't pay the whole $5 or $10, whatever size droplet you get. You only paid for the hours that you actually had it on, because it was less than most of the month. Yeah, and you uh, get the, the FreeBSD support, because they, yeah. they have tested and know how to run FreeBSD on their infrastructure. Yeah, they worked very hard so that when FreeBSD 11 came out, the next day they had it available in DigitalOcean. Yeah, that's very you know, great. That shows that they're actually committed to making sure FreeBSD is in their infrastructure, as opposed to some of the places where you know you go to set up a new thing and it's like offering you FreeBSD nine. Yeah, very okay. old versions it's, that are outdated. Like they added it at some point because somebody asked, but they've not actually cared about it. Whereas you can tell DigitalOcean actually was very interested in FreeBSD and making sure that was there. Yeah, and that you have a choice as a customer to select that as your operating system of choice in DigitalOcean. Yep. So go there, uh, try it out, use the coupon code FreeBSD now, and uh, you know. If you talk to them, tell them how you heard about it on BSD. You heard it on BSD now. But uh, anyway, you guys enjoy the show. I'm mm -hmm. looking forward to seeing you again in the future. And uh, keep up the good work, you guys. Yeah. But we cannot let you leave without giving something. Uh, oh, at least no. I cannot do that. Yeah, okay. So I have a little present for you for uh -oh. all your nice shows that you did with Alan. So I'm a regular watcher from pretty much the first episode. Okay. And uh, yeah, I think this is uh, not only me, but a lot of our viewers and listeners uh -oh. okay. thanking you okay. for all the Nice. Shall I open it interviews. now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I have no idea what this is. So I'm oh, no, yeah, I'm curious, curious now too. too. <laughs> so this is a, uh, a the business book. <laughs> the Adventures of Johnny Bunko: The Last Career Guide You'll Ever Need. Yeah, in case you uh, want to switch gears, and it's it's uh, it's actually officially an, a business book, but okay. it's, it's written as a manga. So oh. Since we're here in Tokyo, I oh, thought this yes. would be a nice. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, here, let me see. I don't know if you guys can see that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I didn't have anything to bring back from Japan, so this is like really cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it's not just uh, comic and, fun, and yeah. funny stuff, but also some, you know, life advice and career advice. Oh, so yeah, I thought this would be appropriate. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. I yeah. had too many meetings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't get me started on that, guys. We we'll drag you on for another yeah. hour just to say the word and we'll come to your rescue. You're right, right. <laughs> but uh, oh, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, yeah. guys. Thank this you is, for this was phenomenal. the show with Alan the best far. Okay. Yeah. 
Well, and I will try to make myself uh, make appearances at future BSD um, BSD conferences too. So yes. maybe oh, yeah. if you guys want to, you know, I know how tough yes. it is to find interviews at conferences, right? Yep. So if you guys need me to, just grab and I'll yep. give you an on the fly one. I have no yeah. problem doing that. So well, good. You're, you're, you're good. Well, right right ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, very cool. Well, again, thank you so much, Ben. I mm -hmm. appreciate it, and uh, long live BSD now, everybody. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We need to find a new catchphrase, probably, but because uh, oh, no. only Chris can do the oh what the only the place, place to, to be SD. SD. <laughs> yeah, you can do that. You yeah, can, but maybe fun. I'll try some old. Okay, okay. Now yeah. you can see what you can come up with. Benedict's <laughs> gonna put his own spin on that, and that's yeah. fine. If you want to keep that as my thing, I'll I'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, very cool. Well, again, wish you guys all the luck in the future. Thank yes. you. Yeah, we'll make this show yeah. a great one. Cool. Continue where you left off. Mm -hmm. So we're joined today by Chris Moore, and we're happy to have him from IX Systems. Yes. And he's here to give us the latest information about his current projects and That's things right. he's working on. And uh, yeah, so yeah, if he's we'll going to, to if he's going to take time off uh, BSD now to do new development work, we want to know what it's going to be. Yeah, that's right. So you, you want the justification for yeah. all this now, right? What are you we working want, on? We want the content. Yeah. So okay. <laughs> we can start with the stuff you've been doing recently, okay. and then we'll get into your future plans. Okay, sure. So um, let's start, I guess, FreeNAS side first, just because mm -hmm. so I'm um, director of FreeNAS and TrueNAS development over at IX Systems right now. So that's mm -hmm. working primarily on the 9 branch, which is currently 9, 10, 2, something, something, mm -hmm. U2, I think. Um, we're working on 9.10.3 that's scheduled to come out sometime mid-April uh, is kind of what we're targeting. We're a little loosey-goosey loosey on that because we're still going to do a TrueNAS release first. Yep. And we do a lot of internal QA with TrueNAS releases. So we've sometimes you know, been right on the dot and released right on the day. And sometimes you find big bugs and have to go back to the drawing board and spend a couple weeks. Yeah, yeah. That sort of thing works. So that, that pushes the FreeNAS release back you know, a few weeks usually. Mm -hmm. But uh, 9.10.3 is going to be really exciting. So just to give you guys an update, I know we have a ton of free NAS users out there who watch BSD yep. now. But uh, 9.10.3 is going to be the first free NAS uh, 9 branch that's based off FreeBSD 11. Mm -hmm. So it's running 11 stable. Um, I don't know what date the 11 stable will be pulled yet because I'm still actually tracking it pretty closely. So it'll be an 11 stable that's pretty recent. Uh, probably the early part of April before I freeze okay. it and stop yeah. pulling upstream. So I'll make sure to get my stuff in there. Yes, it. yes. Yeah. You or any other FreeBSD developers who have patches you want to see in FreeNAS, get it in yep. the So I added uh, an weeks. extra line to top about the compressed oh. arc stats. Oh, so very you can cool. tell mm. how much uh, free arc space you're getting from okay. it. Right? It's been approved right now, right? Hmm? It should yes. be coming yeah, in. It should be free, right? That, that'll land in head soon. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Set the MFC to like a week or two. Yeah, yeah. It's like I like that feature. It's a simple one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's the first thing that's happening. Um, on the FreeNAS side, we're also adding a few new features and services to this new release. So um, the first one I'll talk about is something called MinIO, which I don't know if you guys are ever heard of that. A little bit at the Storage Summit, I learned about it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So MinIO.io is the website. It's a uh, S3 compatible object store. Ah, oh, with Amazon? Mm -hmm. with, like, it's, yeah, so it, emu similar, it's it emulates all the S3 APIs, right? Ah, right. Or, or at least the bulk of them so that it, you know, things like our clone can use it and stuff, right? And then, of course, there's a bunch of like S3 apps for your Android and for your Windows and for all these different things which speak S3. Well, this allows your FreeNAS box to, in essence, be your S3 host. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a really cool thing we're looking forward so to having. That on premise and you know, yes. you're not paying per gigabyte, yeah. it's just the hard drive you already paid for. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be pretty cool. Yeah. So that's a really neat service and uh, has some really neat functionality. But what's really cool is it does, uh, um, I guess, clustered setup is the best way to describe mm -hmm. it. Distributed. So it's going to have the ability to link with other S3 MinIO mm -hmm. clusters and keep things keep state. So mm -hmm. you have like a, a common namespace between them all. So think of like a RAID at the software level to the cluster level. So. Interesting stuff. So there'll be more on that coming soon. Keep an eye on the FreeNAS forum. So that allows you to say have multiple FreeNASs and Correct. the file will exist in at least two FreeNASs. So if one Correct. goes away, your file's still there. Your file's still there and available to be read. Mm -hmm. So And you can get more storage than you can fit in any one Correct. FreeNAS. Yeah, yeah. That, that's helpful for that. So there's going to be some yeah. really neat stuff happening. It's still early days. The MinIO yeah. project is still relatively young, mm -hmm. but it's interesting that it was uh, started by the founders who did Gluster. Yeah. So uh -huh. in some ways, they've kind of taken some stuff. It sounds like like stuff that they learned or maybe wanted to do different from Cluster and, and have improved it, but it's a, it's a Go app. And I, you know, I personally, and I know some of the other FreeNAS developers really like Go. It's, yeah. it's a really cool language, it does some neat stuff. 
but uh, it's Go based, and that's that's pretty cool. So we're looking forward to de debuting that in 9.10.3, probably in single node setups is what we're targeting. Right. So uh, you'll you'll be seeing that coming soon, and uh, heck, it's it's kind of cool because you can use that as your bucket for everything now, and we're going to try and even expose it over Samba, so your actual Samba store is is backed by the S3. Uh -huh. So there's there's some neat stuff happening. Again, I can't promise all that I make all that will make it into 9.10.3, mm -hmm. but we're kind of laying the groundwork. Yeah, that's right. where you're yeah. ready. Yeah. yeah, I I'm a big believer of the open source model of release early, release often. So even if we don't get everything we want in 9.10.3, you know, make small iterative changes yeah. and by the time 9.10.4 comes around, we're adding this new feature and that new feature and you know, making better one step at a time. Yeah. So and but, it's something users can look forward to. Correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the other advantage to that type of approach is you actually learn what people want. Mm -hmm. you, know, yeah. you spend all this time building a feature and then that turns out... And then find out nobody cares. Don't you get feedback, I guess. Or, yeah. or you think everybody's going to use it this way to do this one thing. It turns out they all want to do this other Yeah, there's always what we think in the lab is the best way and then you get it to a customer and they're yeah. like, no, no, we actually do it like this. Like that, yeah. And then you so go so back and... If we had known that before. Me. Yeah, yeah. so it's good to get it out early. Yep. And for those following yep. along, if you're a FreeNAS user, this is all going into our nightly. so if you're on the 910 Nightly train, you're already going to see this starting to land. Some of the initial works there. There's an actual S3 service that shows up now. Mm -hmm. um, not quite all enabled yet. Uh, John Hickson, who's here giving a talk, actually below us right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, he's doing the work to finish that up, and we're thinking in the next week or two you'll see that land in the nightlies, and you can start uh, start playing with it on your FreeNAS box. So. Um, that's an exciting thing happening. Um, another thing is uh, Brandon uh, Schneider, who does the uh, IO cage uh, stuff. He re re rewrote IO cage a few weeks. Uh, well, he started it several months ago, yeah. but he released it officially uh, a few weeks back. And uh, IO cage has been rewritten in Python. And one of the reasons we had him do that was to uh, make it compatible with FreeNAS. We wanted an API, right? Mm -hmm. and, a, and a shell-based IO cage, a little difficult to do a JSON API mm -hmm. and shell, right? So uh, that's going to be coming into 9.10.3. So the plan is to get it into 9.10.3 as, as, uh, as a jail and plugin provider and have just the APIs there for 9.10.3. And then for 9.10.4, we'll do the process of converting all your old jails and plugins to the new IO cage back ones. That'll, that'll deprecate and remove all the warden bits and all the shell bits that right now do your jails and plugins and stuff. But uh, that's coming down the pike. And with that, we rewrote how plugins work on FreeNAS. So, Typically, you just want it to work. So, if you're watching this show, I assume you're more technical and actually want to know what we changed. But mm -hmm. instead of using the old PCBSD PBI format that you know even we got rid of a long time ago, yeah, went to package. Um, IO Cage now uses Package ng for everything. So, um, creating a, a plugin for IO Cage, what's kind of cool is it's not FreeNAS specific now. You can run that same plugin on FreeBSD, TrueOS, oh, FreeNAS. Yeah, that's good. That and, be really nice. and you can have a configuration UI or command line that works on all three. As well. So a plugin on IO cage is basically just JSON. So your JSON manifest file lists, okay, I'm a plugin, I do Plex, we'll just pick an example. Yeah. I depend on FreeBSD 11.0 release, mm -hmm. and these are the packages I need. And IO cage reads that and figures out, okay, let's create the 11 jail, let's install these packages, and then we have something I call an artifact file. And the artifact file, it's not really a file, it's a repo in this case, so you point it at some GitHub repo, and that's your artifact. And what that'll do is at the end of creating the jail, it'll go fetch that repo and look for things like a post install script, or if you have custom config files, um, that's where your UI settings live for like doing a, a, you know, graphical configuration and whatnot. All those exist in this artifact. And it can be a private GitHub, it could be a public GitHub, you can host these anywhere. It's usually just, uh, you know, Couple hundred kilobytes of, of you know icons and, and files, mm -hmm. so the stuff that's needed. But you don't have to know Python. You don't have to know shell. You just basically have to be able to read and write some um, simple JSON for this to appear as a plugin. And what's kind of cool is. One of the big Achilles heels of plugins has always been each program has a different configuration file, right? Some use a database, some use a flat file, some use INI style files, some use just crazy Nginx style self-written things. Self-written yeah. things. Everybody has a different way of doing it. Yeah. And, you know, some some people advocate, well, we're just going to define one plugin format and force all these open source projects to use that. And I, I, half of them don't. Or well, they don't care, care right? Yeah. And, and who has time to do that? Like, if I'm a if I'm the guy writing some something some open source project, I'm not going to go around trying to fit that in every every, other every little appliance ecosystem. or every little thing yeah. to try and make it work. It's just easier if we provide a way to wrap that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the IO cage plugins, the way it works is you can define, a, again, a JSON file that lists uh, configuration knobs. And those knobs internally will have an option to uh, 
either run a, a set or a get command within the jail. And the set and get command you can provide. So it can be something the plugin or port already has, like a lot of them have, um, like Go apps for example, like IPFS has a get and set command already. So you can pretty much just map that into the JSON and say, these are the knobs, these are the flags you give it, and it just does the right thing in the jail. Mm -hmm. If it's something a little more complicated, say you're talking to a database and things got to be restarted and certain order, you know, certain things have to take place, you can supply that get and set command yourself in the artifact. So um, I've written a couple that do like Quassel. Um, yeah, the RC example, client, right? <laughs> and that one has a weird SQL database and some Qt front end to it. It's it's kind of kind of yucky, but I just wrote a, a simple fifty line shell script to do it. And what's cool is because we're agnostic now. As long as your program runs in the jail, we don't care. It could be a Go based set and get. It could be Python. It could be shell. It could be C. Yeah. Hmm. We don't care is the point. So if you're a plugin developer, if you if you know one of the one language or one one way to set and get variables for a plugin, you can now write that. We have not restricted you. And then the UI elements are also JSON. So if you're a web developer, you know things like radio buttons and combo boxes and yeah, drop downs and all that. And so you just define those in a JSON file, and then FreeNAS will render that in the UI. Is the plan? And then TrueOS, we're going to add it to SysADM, so you'll be able to use the same plugin on TrueOS, mm -hmm. and we'll have our nice little Qt app, which renders the same UI elements. Mm -hmm. And so for FreeBSD, you guys don't have a UI, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're a FreeBSD user, you're like, oh, that doesn't help me at all. Well, guess what? IOCage actually exposes that via the command line as well. Oh. So you'll be able to run IOCage, and it'll list all the options, the config knobs like Duplex, like which port is it running on, whatever. And you can run IOCage, set something, something, you know, and supply a value and do it from the command line. So we tried to make it so it just kind of works across the field. Right? Yeah. Command line, UI, doesn't matter. So yeah. I think this will definitely make a lot of these packages more accessible to sure. people. Yeah. Well, to make it accessible, it also means is as a plugin developer, I can write it on TrueOS, or I can write it on FreeBSD, and have some level of confidence that it'll run Integration on, on yeah. FreeNAS, yeah. right? Yeah. Or you write it for FreeNAS, and FreeBSD gets it for free, essentially. Yeah. yeah. So, and and the plugins will be more up to date because mm -hmm. there's a lot less work, and because they're just going to use the package. Correct. The package. Correct. If one person does the update, the other has some benefit as well. This week's episode is brought to you by IX Systems, uh, who are a big sponsor here at Asia BSD Con. So we wanted to give them an extra thank you for. That. Yep. Uh, but they provide all kinds of great hardware that you can use. Uh, whether you want something small like a free NAS Mini uh, to run your home NAS, or, or if you big need servers. something big, big servers to do stuff, you know, they provide all the server hardware that the FreeBSD project uses mm -hmm. uh, to do things like build the packages. So even those are huge CPU servers with lots of RAM in order to build all 27,000 packages yeah. uh, in under a day. Uh, so that we can do it constantly and, and make sure you always have the latest packages with all the security updates. Yeah. And that uh, machine are custom built for yes. a specific purpose. So if you mm -hmm. call IX Systems, they will ask you not the general sales questions, but also what's the purpose of the machine? What do yeah. you use it for? Yeah, and because the important thing when designing a server is not designing it to have the most number of IOPS or whatever. It's designed that in the worst case, it will have at least this many IOPS, yeah. the minimum performance level you can stand. And if the machine can always provide that, it'll always do at least well enough and usually better. Uh, and that's something that a lot of people miss out on, right? If you're com comparison shopping or whatever, just because you know under ideal conditions, it can reach this really high uh, performance that's not necess That's not what's going to happen in production. You need yeah. to know, on worst case, it's going to be able to do enough that our VMs aren't going to be too slow, yeah, or it's going to drop certain. frames in our video recording, or <laughs> whatever it is you're going to do. Yeah. And they test their service before they yes. ship it out very thoroughly. Yes, uh, that's, you know, especially for me, that was a huge thing because I'm having them ship directly to a data center in a country that I'm not physically in right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so if the hard drive dies or something, that's a big pain for me. Yeah. So having them run it in their test lab first, make sure, you know, shake out all those, you know, if a hard drive's gonna die, it usually dies within the first 48 hours of being powered on. Uh, so the fact that they run it for 72 hours first means that they catch those, swap them out, and when I get the server, I just power it on and it just works, and it's very nice. Yeah. They also do uh, custom installation stuff. So when you order the server, you fill out how you want the BIOS configured, what OS you want, how you want it configured, what you want, which NIC you want configured with which IP address, and they'll label them for you mm -hmm. so that when they get to the data center, it says, you know, this cable goes into the it's switch really that goes to the long, internet, yeah. and this one goes into the private SAN so it can access the storage, and yeah, they can label the server for you so it's got the right host name and so that everything's already done. Yeah. All these just, small things add up to the yes. actual value that they provide with the yeah. server. Yeah, uh, and it's just, 
the peace of mind. You know, I remember the first time I built a ZFS machine, I didn't know about IX yet. I made so many mistakes, buying the wrong brand of RAID uh, uh, disk controller, and it was RAID, and it shouldn't have been. And then I had problems when I got the SSDs, and then I realized, huh, so SSDs, when you put them in the three and a half inch uh, hot swap thing, yeah. you need a different caddy for that, because the drive, Oh yeah, it's the, a different the adapters, form yeah, the, yeah, the adapters they give you to, to mount a two and a half inch drive in a three and a half inch bay, center the drive. Mm. But for hot swap, you need to align to the one side. Yeah, so there's actually a special tray for that. Easier, yeah. And so it's like, oh, we had to delay deploying the server by a week because I had to go and order mm. the right trays. And if yeah. I just had IX do it, they would have known that already. Yeah, they had a lot of experience in that yes. area because it's their, their daily business. Yes, and exactly. They did a lot of uh, servers in that yes. way. So, so yeah. yes, check out ixsystems.com slash BSD now and you can tell them what it is you need to build and what you're going to do for it, and they'll help you pick the right hardware. So one of the questions people had was, well, what about, um, you know, packages are always changing, right? So how do you lock it down you know, to a specific set of packages? So um, for IX systems, we have our own Poudrier uh, mm -hmm. builder we're going to run, where we, any, any plugin that we bless as an official IX plugin, we will maintain a package repo that's online a stable version with a stable it. version, and then we will update that periodically, and when we do test it internally to make sure things like Plex work and other stuff. Mm -hmm. But if you're, um, if you're a third-party plugin developer, there's no reason you can't point it at your own repo. Mm -hmm. IO Cage in the JSON lets you define which package repo you're pulling from, so you just supply the um, uh, the fingerprints, so the, the SHA-256 yeah, the, fingerprint the string there. With, yeah. You supply the fingerprint and then the URL where your packages are at. So you could host yours up at DigitalOcean, for example, or whatever, mm -hmm. yeah. and now you've basically made your plugin publicly accessible, or you could just pull from, from the, the free BSD repo. Package repo. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're plugging something that doesn't change or you're worried about it breaking very often from upstream, then just point it at the free BSD repo and you don't host anything. Yeah. yeah. I mean, heck. It's self-maintaining. It is it is self-maintaining at that point. So um, the way Brandon's doing upgrades is also it goes through and it cleans the jail or moves the packages and just reinstalls from upstream. Yep. So um, all your solves all files. Dependency yep. Solves all the dependency problems. So there's no like SAT solver issues, whatever. It just yeah. kind of does a clean like the jail is ready to go, put new packages in, the config files should already still be there. There's an optional migrate script you can run, so it's going to be pretty cool. That's impressive. Right? Very well thought out. Well, we've had so many years that, I mean, yeah, so I guess you've redone the plugin. Yes, yes. Times, like, right? So I did the PBI thing, and Brandon's rewritten, you know, IO cage a few times now in different languages. So. We've had a lot of time to kind of you know think well, about all these for right FreeNAS. Right. This is at least the fourth different plugin system. No. Going back to FreeNAS seven. Yeah, if you go back that far. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For, as far as IX goes, this is like their first or second official one. But but yeah, we've had we've seen the mistakes and we've seen the things that made it really hard to make plugins online. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to make this better. And and because it is running in a jail, you get the speed and all that. Mm -hmm. um, one thing he hasn't added yet, but he's he's looking at is adding Rackdoll support. So we'll be able to, in addition, from IO Cage itself, say, okay, I have a plugin deployed Plex, but I only want to give it this much CPU or this much mm -hmm. memory or heck, even this much IOPS now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can even you know, restrict it so it doesn't take over your disk if you're running a, a free yeah. box. So. Again, really exciting stuff. So yeah. keep an eye, keep an eye out on that. Like I said, the initial version will land in nine ten three, but it'll just be API driven mm -hmm. at that point. And with uh, the command line will be there if you want to play with it. And then uh, nine ten four, we hope to expose that to the GUI, and you'll nice. there'll be a migration script that runs to convert your old Warden based uh, plugins into the new thing. The GUI. Okay. So basically, what that'll do is it'll uh, there's only twenty ish plugins available right now on FreeNAS. So we'll just write a migration script that says, okay, if I'm migrating Plex, you install the new Plex plugin and then copy these config, config files. Over. So it's at least a small enough amount; it's manageable. We can do right. that still. It's not like thousands we have to do. And then the idea is that you'll end up with quite a few more plugins since it's yeah. so much easier. Yeah, going forward, obviously, we're hoping to see this flourish, and all of a sudden, people are. I mean, I did four plugins in an hour a couple weeks ago. Like, mm -hmm. I did Plex, I did Quasal, I did all these other plugins, and it was like, okay, a couple JSON files, done, published. Yeah. Yeah. It's also a good measure to see how quickly it is to mm -hmm. migrate to the new thing. If it's too yeah. complicated or too yeah. too much effort and people don't use yeah. it. I, I really like the idea of using it on vanilla FreeBSD as well. Because mm -hmm. I can see a lot of people throw up a DigitalOcean droplet yeah. and be like, I want 
the closet plug is sure and boom. But what's kind of cool is we have an IX of repo we maintain that lists the plugins, like a plugin index. So you'll be able with an IOKH to actually query and list all the official plugins. Mm -hmm. You can point it at your own repo if you maintain your own third party. Yeah. But at least for the ones that we host, we will offer that out of box. So you can just say IOKH fetch plex and it just does everything. It, it'll make it that much easier to use and maintain FreeBSD for especially people that are just getting started with yeah. that and maybe don't have the expertise to you know, so set up their own jail and install a Quasal and so on versus sure. just saying, you know, IO cage install Quasal plugin. So um, one thing we haven't started on yet that we're already kicking around is adding some more Docker-like functionality to it. Mm -hmm. So the one thing I really want to get away from is the idea of a plugin you have to manually set up IP addresses. Right. So what I'm hoping at some point to do is have the plugin where you define a port or a range of ports and uh, it'll automatically do the, the NAT and forward that from the host IP address. So the JLIP will just be some internal address that you don't necessarily have to care about, and yeah. then the plugin will define, like, these are the ports we want to expose. Yeah. And so that, that'll be the next step going forward. We're not, we haven't quite decided how we're going to do that yet. Is it going to be uh, IPFW? Do we do some NAT stuff? I, we don't. Mm -hmm. and yeah. I haven't quite made those determinations yet because there's still too many other things to work on. But that, that is the eventual goal is even the plugin itself, it's like you don't even have to care that it's running in a jail on some, mm -hmm. you know, 172 address or something. Yeah. And it yeah. just, it just kind of works. works. It uses yeah. your host IP address, which will make it easy for like something like DigitalOcean. Yeah, where right? you only have the one IP address. You have the one IP and you just start it up and oh, Plex is running now. Or oh, Fossil's now running. I don't have to go yeah, run any much. rules or anything myself. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Um, that's exciting stuff. So that's all coming soon. Stay tuned. Hopefully, uh, I'll be back in a few months and talk to you guys about how it all landed. Yeah. <laughs> or it all blew up in our face. Or then we were writing the next thing. It was terrible. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that's that's some good new stuff coming down the pike. Mm -hmm. right. Or coming down the pipe. Um, let's see here. So, uh, TrueOS side. Yeah. So, um, TrueOS, as of this last week, um, if you're using an X1 Carbon, like the Skylakes, or even earlier, mm -hmm. the, the video support's gotten really good on that now. We fixed, there was a regression a couple weeks ago where um, acceleration wasn't working, and that's now fixed. So we're actually recommending using the mode setting driver with Glamour, and that works perfectly now. Yeah. Just uh, And on mine, for example, I can suspend resume, brightness buttons work, um, mm -hmm. webcam works, uh, Wi-Fi work. I mean, everything just kind of works. It's almost weird. I haven't had brightness buttons for so long that I forget <laughs> to check them. To use them, uh, and it's like, oh, this this does something now. This is yeah. really cool. I, so, I've been doing the CCTL. It's like yeah, right. hardware that ACPI yep. that video yeah, that LCD yeah. zero that brightness equals eighty. Well, you know, we, we do these things because we're just so used to it not working. It's yep. like suspend or zoom. Like I don't even try to try it in so long because yeah. it's like I just knew it wouldn't work, and now that works. So. Um, that's exciting stuff. So if you're looking for a new laptop, I know we've always recommended Lenovo's to run FreeBSD or TrueOS. I think this is probably going to be the new hot one to get for a while anyway. Because yeah. if you're looking for like a MacBook Air replacement, this is definitely a worthy worthy model that uh, many of our TrueOS developers run. So it's the X1 Carbon Gen 3? I'm running Gen 3, yeah, the Skylake yeah. version. I don't know, it might be a Gen 4 out by now. Yeah. Yeah. Knows. But I know the Gen 3 works very well, so recommend that one uh, wholeheartedly. Um, might be time to upgrade this one here at some point. Uh, yeah, yeah, it works well enough. You like that massive software. battery pack, man. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't walk up the hill with that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I might get a new one just because the internal battery only holds about half the charge it used oh, to. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I say I've been uh, very fortunate with mine. I can go through the whole conference now without yeah. plugging in, so yeah. it's, it's yeah, pretty it nice. I did that yesterday, power up. but I only had about forty-five minutes left. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so that's sure. that's a very worthy laptop. Um, on the TrueOS side, we just brought in a LibreSSL 2.5.1 into the base system. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't switched over the ports tree to building with it yet, because I have a feeling when I do that, I'm going to have all sorts of things fail to build in Poudre. So I'm going to wait till I get home and have hopefully gotten a little sleep under my belt before mm -hmm. I, I flip that switch and see everything blow up. <laughs> yeah, so, well, goes, yeah. You know, uh, Baptiste and Bernard and I were conspiring during the death a little bit. And the making SSL and base private has, has advanced a bit further. Okay. Okay. Uh, and so we talked about that yeah. last year, I yeah. think. Yeah. 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 Uh, I had a patch that started in January of last year or so, uh, and it got the library to be private, but it didn't hide the header files. Oh. And okay. as soon as you move those. Wow, to a lot of things that you didn't think depended on SSL depend on SSL. We've I've seen that in ports. There's a lot of things that silently pull up base system dependencies and you don't really yeah. know it. Well, this is just looking at the base system. Oh wow, it's like the base hey, system. Hey, Ed has a DES mode. It's like oh, you didn't know that. and then um, okay. Dump on has encryption now, right? Because you can do encrypted crash dumps. No, of course. So, yeah. so that has some headers and yeah. It's like, but why does that use that header? 
No, so that uses the header but doesn't link to the library. What does that even make sense? Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, so a okay. bit more work there, but hopefully that can happen too. Uh, and That's that fantastic. Will, uh, you know, that'll make our lives a little easier going yeah. forward. Cause well, especially right now, things kind of work because if you're running 11, the base system and ports tree have the same version of mm -hmm. OpenSSL. Mm -hmm. But at some point, the ports version is going to become 1.1. Yeah. .1 that's something. Yeah. Uh, and then anything that tries to mix the two is going to explode horribly. Mm -hmm. Well, and we want to be able to use the developer version of LibreSSL. So, yeah, we kind of use that's the one one. We're, we're, TrueOS is a rolling release. We have a lot of people doing development on it. So yeah. we try to stay a little bit more on the cutting edge or yeah. bleeding edge in some yes. cases. Because, well, if you know the problems are coming, then it's a yeah. lot easier to get <laughs> for it. That is much easier. So yeah, we'll look forward to that change. That'll yeah. be very helpful. Um, let's see, what else on the TrueOS side? So SysADM, which is our um, you know, local and remote management. Yeah, there's a talk here at Asia BSD Conference. Yeah, Drew's giving like an hour or so. Yeah, in, in a little bit. Yeah. Um, we're just in the process of updating the website. It might already be live by the time you guys see this, but we're putting up the Windows and OS X clients. Mm -hmm. So you can now remotely control, use the same control panel on TrueOS on Windows or OS X to remotely control your system. So we use it internally for QA. A lot of our build nodes all run FreeBSD. And we install the SysADM package and then actually remotely control them from our desktop, which is like package management and everything else. Um, that's in the process of growing IO cage support, so we'll actually have a nice GUI jail manager again here pretty soon, mm -hmm. which will be pretty cool, which we'll do the plug-in stuff we mm -hmm. talked about yeah. here in the near future, so keep an eye out for that. Um, SysADM just landed in ports as well. I just committed version 1.0 of both the server and the client. Um, to the ports tree uh, right next right after I got here. So that is now a thing for FreeBSD users. And for those that don't know, go listen to Drew's talk, but yeah. it gives you a nice REST and WebSocket interface to FreeBSD. Mm -hmm. It's written yeah. using QT, but without the X bits, just the core. Yeah. So I am definitely looking forward to uh, a, free NAS, a headless FreeNAS on my land that I can manage mm -hmm. from my desktop yeah. uh, more responsibly than a web interface. Yes. And, uh, you know, especially if I have a bunch of them. And mm -hmm. We're working really on that. Cool. There'll yeah. be some news about that in the near future, too. Yeah. So stay tuned. Well, we especially if, if you get the mini, mini IO thing going and you got multiple free NASs federated together. Yeah, you want a, a single pane of glass is yeah. the big hot button. We're here. Yeah. There's internal stuff we're working on about that. I, mm -hmm. I, won't, yeah. I won't spill all the beans on that. Needless to say, stay tuned. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll have something to it. And it offers too. a lot more possibilities for users to yes. kind of use this. Yes. Now, not everyone, not everyone cares. Some people yeah. want one free NAS, but yeah. there's right. a lot of us who run multiple ones or yeah. businesses that do. Yeah. So or my free NAS is full and I need a second one, but I yes. can't take the first one down. Yeah, <laughs> so there's there's some interesting stuff happening in that space, so mm -hmm. stay tuned there as well. Um, let's see, over on the, the TrueOS side here, uh, let's see, the WikiLeaks stuff was good for us. Mm -hmm. So it turns out <laughs> if you rebrand your project every year, by the time the documents leak about all the old exploits, like that applies to the old name and nobody, yeah, oh look, well, well, there's that's nothing against TrueOS. So <laughs> I heartily recommend renaming once a year. That's a good way to go. <laughs> Those documents, that's stale. That's uh, a PC piece. Well, like uh, the one I saw was a vulnerability in how It was so in how applied to Lex every OS and everything. Yeah. 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 It technically applied to FreeBSD, except for the fact that we don't install it by default. But sure. most people running a laptop are going to have it installed. Well, there's some things that bring it in, like K3B uses how still for yeah. discovering mm -hmm. CD to DVD drives and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, like that having was, a medicine keyboard work in X required it for a long time. It did for a long time. DevD now is yeah. the way forward there. So yeah, in TrueOS, for example, HAL, I don't think we install by default anymore, but it's optional. Like again, if you bring in certain things or package install certain things, it'll get sucked in with it. Mm -hmm. But uh, like that was the worst thing I've seen so far. But yeah, there's more coming. There's there. more coming, I'm told. So. Uh, We'll keep an eye out for that, and of course, we're being very responsive, keeping an eye on all this, because yeah, we take security very seriously. Yeah, I think uh, the best approach there is what the OpenBSD people said. You know, mm -hmm. uh, if you see something there, submit a bug report. Yeah, you know, we we don't yeah. necessarily have time to come through that whole no, set of and, documents, but if you see something that we should know about, definitely make sure it's been the same with us, and the community has been really good on the forums and stuff about yeah. discussing this and going, oh, here's one of the things that was reported. Are you still vulnerable to this? No, no, that's yeah, that yeah, went away two years ago. Hell that nobody uses. Yeah, anymore. that went away two years ago. So um, that's been an interesting ride, and of yeah. course, by the time this airs, maybe some more info will be out, and we'll see what comes next. Just scrambling yeah. to fix those. Yeah, I might be scrambling to fix something. Who knows? But at the at the moment, everything's looking good. So. Um, Let's see, that's exciting. Uh, we're doing some work with IPFS right now to, mm -hmm. for package repositories. So um, 
stay tuned on that, but we're, we're trying to make it a little easier because PC, uh, TrueOS, oh, I keep saying that, mm -hmm. PCBSD, TrueOS is a rolling release. Yeah. So one of the annoying things I know that annoys users and annoys software developers is uh, when you go package install things, a lot of times you'll get that dreaded, you can't install this now because the version upstream has a different ABI or is newer than what you're currently running. You need mm -hmm. to upgrade first, yeah. which is there for a reason. So first of all, yes, you can get around that by doing package, package static, but understand you're taking a risk. Because yeah. if the upstream is indeed a newer ABI version that's radically different, mm -hmm. you may be upgrading. Because a new syscall. It's just a new syscall, it just won't work, right? So we put that in there for a reason. It's not that we hate that's you. to annoy people. <laughs> right? <laughs> if we want to make sure you don't end up not being able to start X, for example, mm -hmm. or something. But uh, we're looking at using some IPFS uh, functionality with our uh, update manager so that you'll be able to pin a repo locally to your box. And then, you, or for example, because IPFS can share across your local LAN, like you could pin one repo locally and like I could share it to all my TrueOS boxes at the house. Like, yep. okay, you don't have to upgrade right away. You still have the full package repo as it existed in this point of time. Yep at your fingertips and then you're when you're ready to upgrade then it'll go out and reach out to the internet and, and do its update again so yeah. uh, there were some interesting features discussed about package yesterday for package okay. two mm -hmm. uh, having basically a pool directory and all the packages are actually named their hash yeah uh, and then hard linked into directories mm -hmm. per basically release of the package system sure meaning that you can still get the old packages and packages that didn't change will yep. be shared across the repos? Yeah, that's that's kind of like what Pudrier does a little bit internally now, where you can yeah. turn on the uh, what is it, the atomic updates or something, and it, it keeps the old versions, and it just yeah. updates so the this link is or whatever. The, the published package repo yeah. will be able to do that as well. Yeah, that would be um, really cool. Um, and it will also solve the problem of the package repo update in the middle of me installing things, and I get the weird, mm -hmm. you know. Now I get checksum errors yeah. or something, right? Yeah. While so I'm I in the middle download of download file. three gigs of data. Yeah. So, um, and then the other thing If that you speak to BAPT, mm -hmm. one thing that would be awesome for PKG is some way to cache the DNS uh, lookups. Because right now it's a little annoying, you know, as working with the yes. CDN, where if it's in the middle of an update or you accidentally hit a node yeah, that's a little out of yeah. date, right? It's doing a thousand so, fetches in a row and each one has a different DNS lookup. Yeah, right? uh, so Brad and I looked at making it use a redirect to pin to a certain server and also to the version of the repo so okay. that that change. Uh, but with libfetch, that was kind of complicated. Yeah, it was, it's, it's a tricky problem to solve, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, we're trying to tackle some of these things with, with uh, IPFS, for example. The biggest thing for IPFS for me is you can run, um, you can keep a local copy of it behind your firewall, yep. mm -hmm. right? So once you've downloaded and cached the repo locally, then I don't have to go out to the internet to yes. download and four gigs every time. The, the hash names for the files will Solve the invalidation problem. Correct. Too, you're Correct. You're always it. pulling from the right consistent repo. Either. But it will. Yeah, you won't end up with. I have a file cache with the same name, but it's older. It's not the same. Correct. This solves that. <laughs> yeah. And so there's some interesting yes. stuff which I'll need to speak to you about. I have some ideas on yes. how we can integrate that with Scale Engine. But anyway. That's why we go to these conferences. That's why we go to these to conferences, the right and we have good ideas, and then we go yeah. home and go, oh, that sucks. Uh, that's what we're like. <laughs> you know, a couple of months of package development happens, uh, and then you get four people in a room with a whiteboard mm -hmm. and uh, twice as much work gets done in, in four hours. Exactly, exactly. So uh, yeah, that's, I guess, uh, I don't know if I'm forgetting, I'm sure I'll forget something in 10 mm -hmm. minutes from now after we're all packed up, I'll be like, oh yeah, I should have uh, mentioned told that, them about that, but I hope write it down for next time. I will, I yeah. will. Hopefully I've given you guys enough to chew on, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, Lumina's still making progress. I know Ken works on that, so I'm not gonna mm -hmm. spill all his beans, but there's work um, ongoing there. We, we're very actively keeping an eye on Wayland. Yeah, support. Yeah, yes. we're so, very excited uh, when that hit the port straight. So uh, it's still too early to talk about because we haven't done enough with it yet to yeah. really say what the route forward looks like with that. Maybe this time next year we'll be talking about we have a beta version of Wayland. Yeah. Because uh, mm -hmm. it's it, there's a lot of work for us to do. So Qt natively now is Wayland backend support, but then we have to go through an update. Like uh, our login manager has a lot of X calls. We'll have mm -hmm. to you know, rip those out and yeah. make them Wayland native, and then. Lumina, of course, will have to have its own window manager that doesn't use Fluxbox and doesn't use any X calls to so make that Wayland native. So um, it's definitely very much in the back of our minds right now. Like we know this is coming, and we're mm. already kind of trying to figure out what a route forward looks like. But until until we get the other things done, that's going to remain on the back burner until we know it's solid and ready for for prime time, yeah. if you will. So. 
um, yeah, that's uh, it's going to be an exciting 2017. There's a lot of good stuff. Again, Freenas is happening and TrueOS is happening. There's a lot of a lot of cool stuff all happening right now. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's part of the reason why I'm so busy and not doing yeah, this right now. So, yeah. That's pretty it's crazy. Too much work to get done. There is a lot of work to get done. It's a blessing and a curse. Yeah. It is. It is. <laughs> but it'll be nice to, to work on some code again. And I have a lot of things that have nagged me that I've been wanting to do and just haven't had the time. So um, True OS Pico is another one. Like I'm going to talk about that here at Asia BSD Con. And, um, hopefully in the next few weeks, hopefully, I've been saying this now for two months, but <laughs> hopefully now that I have a little bit more time, if my Wednesdays don't get sucked up, I'd like to get back on getting some Pico stuff worked on. Specifically, yep. the Raspberry Pi 3 now has support for FreeBSD, or yep. I guess FreeBSD has support for Raspberry Pi 3, <laughs> put it that way. way um, also, we were looking at, uh, I have Minnow Wards at the house, which are a little bit bigger than the Raspberry Pi 3, yeah. but they have a, a true gigabit NIC on it, which is probably the biggest limitation of the Pico at the moment on a Raspberry Pi is that Ethernet, uh, USB Ethernet just it's sucks cool. yeah. Yeah. for that. For doing X11 forwarding, oh, it's horrible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, the middle board may be a more attractive option. It's a little more expensive, $60, $70, I believe. Mm -hmm. But for a thin client, that's still not a bad price. Yes. Yeah. Totally. That's really not a bad price. So, and now that we have all the latest and greatest Intel stuff starting to work with uh, with TrueOS, like I'm, I'm a lot more optimistic that the Minnow board will be a, a good viable thin client that you can do. So, for those who don't know, the Pico is basically just a, you know, a Raspberry Pi middle board or whatever, and it becomes a thin client terminal. You plug it in, you put the Pico image on it, you boot it, it scans the network for your Pico server, which is a TrueOS box, and then it just boots you into X there and gives you the remote login and, mm. and you go. And then we did some work, I got a virtual GL working, so you can do things like Minecraft in it, and you're actually using the GPU on the host, not on your little client. So you could put like a beefy NVIDIA card in there, mm. you know, have, we, we tested like three Minecrafts running simultaneously on it. Yeah. It was really cool, like it worked, and that's, yeah. huh. you know, I got five kids, and that's what I want for my house. <laughs> this way you don't need five computers with big NVIDIA yeah. cards. And I've had to do that, right? Everybody has their own computer, and I've had, to, and now they're getting a little old. Now oh, I got to upgrade five computers. Uh, It'd be nice to have a thin client, and I'll just set up one hunk and powerhouse server. Maybe have the storage backed by FreeNAS, uh, mm -hmm. you know, NFS or something, and, mm -hmm. and go to town. Like yep. I think that would be a smarter move at this point. I mean, I practically have a small office in my house with yeah. all these kids, so <laughs> yeah. um, that's very attractive to me, and I think uh, could be attractive to other businesses as well. Oh, yeah. Just as a really cheap way to give people a terminal where they can, you know, watch videos on YouTube and waste time doing things besides yeah. working, and then you know, do you could, it could be really useful for being building kiosk type things. It could be. Yeah, uh, it could be. Just all kinds of business. We went through. Did a bunch of we went through and did a bunch of hooks into the login manager in Lumina so it understands what a Pico client is so it does things like the sound forwarding with Pulse Audio over the network and and uh, disable certain things that you see so you can't shut down the host system via yeah, via the remote login. Log yeah, yeah, yeah. So we we've, we've gone through and done a little bit here and there but the hope is in the next few months we'll have more to talk about with that again hoping that I get some free time yeah. to work on that. Yes. So. Uh, uh, yeah, again, almost too many projects to work yeah, on. Yeah, too many but, yeah, exciting things to work on. You know, small changes, a little bit here, a little bit there, and then a year from now, we're a lot farther than we were last year. So mm -hmm. um, hopefully there'll be a lot of cool new stuff we'll be talking about this time next year. Yeah, yeah and hopefully uh, I'll be able to, uh, Eric McCorkle and I are working on the uh, passing the Gelly encryption keys from the bootstrap to the loader to the kernel okay. better. Uh -huh. uh, so it actually does the derived key rather than the passphrase. Sure. So sure. your password isn't passed around in plain text. That's cool. Uh, and it also means that you don't have to do the two to five second uh, deriving the key for each hard drive uh, three times yeah, during the boot. Sense. You do it just once. Um, and that leads also into Gelly support in EFI. Ooh. Uh, yeah, and then we can have the full disk encryption. Uh, with keep EFI. bugging about that because yes. we have many TrueOS users are eagerly, including myself, because I EFI mm -hmm. boot my laptop. I would like to do full disk jelly. Yeah. Uh, and then, <laughs> and then I have to find time to work on having a, the jelly key file mm -hmm. on a USB stick. Okay. And if that USB stick isn't stuck in your computer, you can't. You can't do access the drive. That's very cool. We got a request from one of the guys here at the conference to add a. Uh, the ability to have your boot live on a USB stick with TrueOS by default, because for their security, they want mm -hmm. they well, want it set up that way. Yes, uh, I think my solution would work for them as well. Yeah, I think that would be yeah, a, yeah, it was a good option. idea from Pavel. Okay, well there you go. Who's Marius? Is yeah, yeah so. he's the guy. The one's asking for it. So yeah, if that's yeah. what they want. Yeah. I would love that. That exactly. would be fantastic. Oh. The last sponsor this week is Tarsnap. Backups for the truly paranoid. 
very truly paranoid. Yes. Uh, you, know, you get the source code for the client, so you can compile it yourself and audit it yourself and know that your data is encrypted on your machine before it's sent to the cloud. And it's the only way to ensure that your data can be deleted from the cloud. Right? The cloud, you know, they have backups to tape and it's replicated to all these machines. So no matter what, you can never be 100% sure they actually deleted it. But if it's encrypted with a key and you have the only copy of that key the and you owner. destroy it, then that data is useless. It, yeah. it, can ever, it cannot ever be decrypted uh, and that's how you can ensure that your data is safe in the cloud. Yeah. And Colin Percival, who's the uh, author of TarSnap, he also has a challenge for people who want to look at the source code and find errors in there that are security related or might be something that could be exploited. Uh, he will give you money if you find something that yep. is uh, suspicious or not very secure. Yep. Uh, there's a bug bounty program. The bounties are doubled during betas uh, ahead of new releases. And the bug bounty program covers everything including typos. So if you find a missing period, you can get paid. <laughs> Although yeah. most of those are gone now because everybody's done that. <laughs> but it's still worth looking at for your own peace of mind before you back up your data. Yeah. So if you want to have something backed up that's really important to you, try out TarSnap. Yeah. Uh, the command line interface is very much like Tar, super easy to cron tap. You set it up and forget it. You know. And right? there's also a multi-platform thing because yeah. it's not only running on Unix, it's also running on Windows. And there's also a book about it by Michael Lucas. Yeah. And so that if you, it's it's relatively easy to use. But if you want to have something to read about it, um, there's yeah. also a book about TarSnap. Yeah, uh, it's a great way to set up a, a more nuanced backup routine, and also good advice on best practices. And you know, testing your uh, restores every once in a while, make sure your files will actually work, and safe management of your key. So your key for TarSnap, uh, you can uh, print it out in a format that it's easy to OCR, uh, so that you don't have to type in the whole long key yeah, if you ever do lose the digital version of it. Uh, and it also has a checksum, uh, so that if you make a typo while typing it in, it can tell you which part is wrong, uh, so that you can not be, have to just be think, sure. I made a typo somewhere in this giant this like 30 lines of text that yeah. I just typed out. It'll be like, actually, the checksum says that line eight is actually the one where you made a typo. Yeah. So you can fix that and get it to work. Yeah. But you know that means you can print out your key, laminate it, and put it in a safety deposit box or something, uh, so that You're the no matter guy. what happens to your computer, you know if you, if your keys on your computer and your laptops get stolen, then how are you going to restore your backup? Yeah. Uh, so you need to have the key somewhere safe, and it makes it easy to do that. Yeah. So yeah, check out TarSnap for your backups into a secure location and mm -hmm. rest safely at night. That yes. your data is stored somewhere where people take care yep. about keeping it safe. That's tarsnap.com slash BSD now. And if you talk to Colin or anybody else from Tarsnap, make sure you, you tell them they heard about it here on BSD now. That reminds me, one other thing we did do, uh, Grub officially got dropped for True Last. Mm -hmm. so I ate that yeah. out about two weeks ago, <laughs> so if you go do an install, there are no more Grub options. So, sorry, it's not that I hate you dual boot people, it's just that Grub sucks yeah. so hard. And it's EFI been Refind is just so yeah. much easier to yeah. handle in an installer. So that's what we did is actually, if you dual boot, we recommend you do EFI now, mm -hmm. and then it'll automatically install the uh, Refind EFI utility, which is nice because you get the graphical buttons and it yeah, looks really pretty, but then, but then it properly chain loads the BSD loader, so you can do your jelly and do your boot environment yeah, selection. Like the full to, native boot. You get the full native boot. So going forward, we recommend if you are a dual booter, triple booter, quad boot type. I mean, we have a few of those yes. out there, right? You want to do it on EFI. That's and it's be just much better. so much safer. Yes, it's not going to clobber anything. Way and safer. You can always get an EFI shell if it does. Yeah, it's just. Yeah, yeah. It's so much less complicated. It's just yeah. It's it's better in every way. So just. If you're still on Grub, I'm sorry, get off it. If you need instructions or help with that, post to the forums, we can mm -hmm. give you a hand. It's actually, um, I did several in-place upgrades on my systems at the house that still have Grub, and it's yeah. just a few G part commands to modify a partition type, resize it, restamp it, done. Yes. So also, not, not if, hard. If you're really into it, mm -hmm. the FreeBSD loader has chain load support now. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, it can chain load off a uh, fat partition. Oh, okay. uh, because the FreeBSD loader was ported for Lumos, yeah, and they actually the chain one. load uh, like a 300 megabyte fat partition, and that's how they start their kernel. Okay, okay. Uh, because of reasons. Um, 
And so it means that you know, one could technically probably make the FreeBSD that, loader chain load a Linux. Okay. So is that automatic? Like, is it the old school where you get the F1, F2 to chain load different uh, it's, or? Well, it's in the actual loader in the menu. So oh, I think that one currently you'd have to drop to the shell and okay. chain loader, okay. but you could add a menu option you that would just chain load the other one. Okay. Well, that's like cool. a loader dot. Uh, or local.rc or whatever okay. they call it to add a menu option. Well, I don't think I'm going to be adding support for no, that, but, but if somebody in the community but if somebody was really stuck that. on Grub and didn't want to do EFI, yeah. there is a way you could make the so you could still do it. Yeah. Okay, well that's kind of cool. And yeah, if somebody out there is interested or wants to document that for us, we'll put it in the handbook. Mm -hmm. and just, I'm not going to have time to yeah, get to that one. Yeah. Yeah. I fixed the EFI. What more do you want? Exactly. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's enough value in doing it, but okay. uh, there's there's some support there now, uh, thanks to Thomas Soon uh, from the Illumos project. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Want anything else you want to ask, guys? Or? Uh, that's a lot of material already. Yeah. Yes. Okay. To process. Well, you yeah. know, if you have me on, uh, give me enough of a window in between. Hopefully, I have new stuff to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. You see Time flies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, next year uh, we'll have to do this again and mm -hmm. give you guys an update. So. Yeah. That's the view.